Hey everybody, welcome to the King's Table. Glad to have you with us. Sorry we couldn't be doing this uh, live on Facebook, um, but I'm just figuring out computers evidently. So, <laughs> uh, But we have a guest with us tonight, so excited. Pam Worley is with us as Kendra is away. And uh, I've known Pam for a few years and had the privilege of being on worship teams together. And um, so excited to have you with us tonight, Pam. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, she doesn't know this, and so this is, might be coming as news, but Pam and her husband, Doug, are uh, personal heroes of mine. Um, I, When I lived in Montana, I used to watch their marriage and how they honored each other, and I was so encouraged by it uh, all the time. And um, their kids were in my youth group, and uh, so that you guys, Pam, were a family uh, that I looked up to and uh, really wanted to kind of uh, model some things after. And so you may have never known that, but you guys really were uh, heroes and still are heroes of mine. Um, and I always imagined if I had hair, it would look nice like Doug's. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, cool. Well, we're going to get going tonight. And um and uh, I would love if you just pray over us and pray for everybody that's watching, and, and we'll get after the uh, things this evening. Absolutely. Father, I thank you that we get to just come and be in your presence tonight and share your heart with the people that are watching. And Lord, we just invite your Holy Spirit to come and um, be our words, speak through us, Lord, and that your message would go and touch the lives that it needs to touch, Lord, that there would be an impact in uh, helping people discover their true identity. I just ask that you would bless and anoint Pastor Joey for sharing his heart with us, and um, just come, Lord. That's all we ask. That's our heart's desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Cool. Before we get going, did you have a good Easter or what? Yes, I did. Good, good. Did you guys do anything cool? No, we didn't really do much, actually. Kyler and Doug both had to work, so we had a late dinner. Late dinner, we cool. We go to the Civic Center for service, and uh, Kyler, or Caden and Kelsey and I did. Awesome. And we just hung out and played games. Good deal, good deal. And, and nobody went on a crazy sugar high from Easter candy or anything like that. No, it was pretty laid back. Good, <laughs> we that's awesome. for Caden, but that was really all. There you go. Good deal. Yeah, it was. We had we had fun. It was. Uh, we sat down around the um, table um, Easter morning, and you know we do a little bit of you know uh, candy and surprises for the girls just to celebrate. And um, and so, man, you really test your ability as a speaker to hold your children's attention while you're telling the Easter story. When Candy's sitting in front of them at That's seven in the morning. <laughs> there were definitely some children around us at church that were like, I want to go home, Mom. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Nothing like the Easter jitters from sugar. Exactly. Well, tonight, uh, we're just going to continue on uh, with our series in identity, and the title of this is Less is More. Um, it's a, um, a message that I have been really working on personally in me. Uh, preaching to me, um, and I guess really going on the last three years, um, and uh, and it's something God still, it, the, the times when I think I'm catching it, I don't know if you have things in your life, you're like, I think I'm getting better at this, <laughs> then you realize, no, I'm not getting any better, um, and so anyways, I, uh, as I've been working and, and, and praying through uh, what to share tonight and how to bring this, man, I just... It kept bringing up in me, man, these are things I need to submit to the Lord. Here's another area. Here's another area. And it wasn't brutal, but it was, you know, eye-opening, you know, in some areas when I just get honest with myself because um, you, whenever you're sharing something, if it, if it doesn't come from the heart, it won't be transformative to anybody else. Uh, okay. You can always provide information, but you'll never provide transformation. And um, so anyway, so just be honest with you guys tonight as I preach this to you, it's something I've been preaching to myself for the last three years, really. Um, I want to pick up uh, in a passage that Easter Sunday, um, and I know anybody watching this video, I'm dating the video by referencing that we just went past Easter Sunday. But um, it, this would have been a passage that a lot of pastors would have preached out of is Luke 24. Um, the, the resurrection has occurred. The, uh, if you remember, the the, uh, the women had prepared spices the day Jesus had died, but 
the day got too late. Uh, it became um, uh, the Sabbath, and so all day Saturday, while the law commands them the rest, they couldn't do anything. Uh, and so Sunday morning hits, and the women get up and they go uh, to the tomb, and and um, they encounter the angels that, that ask the famous line, "Why do you look for the living among the dead?" And uh, so you've got this whole story that's going on, and then there's an encounter that Jesus has on the road to Emmaus with um, these two people, two Jesus followers. Uh, really, we only know that one's name is Cleopas. We don't know who the other one is. Um, but it's a really interesting, powerful thing. But there's something that happens here at the end that I want to look at and discuss. So Jesus has journeyed with these people. And Scripture in, in Luke 24 says that God kept them from recognizing him. In verse 16, it says God kept them uh, from recognizing Jesus. And so there's a discussion that's happening of well, what's your week just been like kind of a thing. And they're like, well, you must be the only one that doesn't know um, everything that went on. And, you know, and so they fill in Jesus and then Jesus preaches really the first Easter sermon where he starts breaking down scripture to them and how this was going to happen and all this. And so Jesus, uh, you know, if you know the story, he gets invited. He's going to keep on going, but they invite him. Once they get to Emmaus, come stay with us. It's getting late. And so where we're picking up is the part where uh, he's being invited to dinner. In verse 28 of chapter 24 of Luke, and I'm reading New Living Translation, it says, By this time they were nearing Emmaus, the end of their journey, and Jesus acted if he were going on. But they begged him, Stay the night with us, since it's getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at, at that moment, he disappeared. I always say, man, I hope there is like DVR in heaven, you know, because there's things I want to go back and see. And I really want to see what did the disappearing Jesus moment look like. You know, I have a very nerded out fantasy that it's a Star Trek moment where they're like, he's beamed away and there's sparkles and, you know, it's surely not like that. But um, being a sci-fi nerd, that's what I hope for secretly. And um, But it's a crazy moment where their eyes are open with this, the, the blessing of bread and the breaking it and the giving it. And, um, and when I get into scripture, I ask a lot of questions. I don't know if you do, like, I mean... And a lot of times I, I have more questions than I have answers when I'm impatient because I ask a lot and don't listen very good. Um, but there's something Jesus does here clearly that clicks with these guys, the blessing, the breaking of bread. And really, if you start looking at Jesus's ministry, this is a habit uh, that he has. It's like this is his thing the blessing and the breaking of bread. And so I just want to reference a couple things real quick. So the first time you really see Jesus doing this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? Mm -hmm. All these people we recognize that when he feeds the 5,000, Matthew chapter 14, this is also recorded in all the gospels. But in Matthew 14, uh, all these people are there listening. You know, we know that with men and women, it's way more than 5,000 because women always seem to turn out in more numbers at church uh, than men do. And, uh, so all these people there, and it's the um, five loaves and two fish, right? And mm -hmm. Jesus says, this is what we need. We're good to go. And he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he gives it. And, um, and then there's, uh, after it's all said and done, there's 12 baskets full left over, right? And then you move on. Uh, if you're reading this uh, in Matthew, you can move on to chapter 15. Um, and in verse 16, it, it, it references again the blessing and breaking of the bread, and that's when he feeds the 4,000. Um, and then if you keep on going in Matthew, Matthew 26, verse 26, now he's with his disciples at the Last Supper. He blesses and breaks the bread again, and he gives it. And then now you're at Luke 24, where uh, the cross has happened, the resurrection's occurred, and he's with these followers uh, of him, uh, and he blesses and breaks it, and then their eyes are open. And um, what I want to look at tonight, when I say less is more, I have always um, had a bad habit of associating my successes in, in whatever area to um, my identity either being uh, greater or less than. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, if, I, if I feel like I've had a greater success, then I feel better about my identity or myself. If I feel like I had a less than, same thing. But kingdom is not like that. And so this is, this is how I see it. Jesus feeds the 5,000. So the group that he's feeding, when he feeds the 5,000, and it's more people than that we know, but when he, let's just use that number for now. When he feeds the 5,000, it's mainly, predominantly, almost entirely a group of Jewish people, um, which is, which is a, an incredible number when you start breaking down the logistics of how long it would have taken and all that stuff. It's a large number of people. Um, and so it's an amazing miracle, and all the Gospels record it. And... Um, it's an incredible thing. If you would hear about that happening today, mind's blown right all over the place. And the next time it happens, it's interesting because you would think, you know, strategically, you would want to see things escalate, you know. Uh, in my mind, I would. But the next time, there's less people. So you get to Matthew 15 when he feeds the 4,000. And if you look at where he is and the landscape that he's at and, and um, the area, the locale, He's not feeding Jewish people this time. He's feeding Gentiles this time. And so he's got 4,000 people. It's less of a number. But if you look at it, the number of Gentiles as a people group to the number of Jews, he's feeding less at that moment, but there's a greater impact in the grand scheme of things, right? Uh, the Jewish nation would have been a smaller nation, even though he fed more people in that moment. It was a smaller nation. He feeds less to the Gentiles but the impact is then grander. Now you get to his 12 disciples, talk about dramatic reduction in ministry. You're sitting around a table, not even everybody likes you. And, uh, you know, and you just fed 12. And this wasn't even a miracle. This is something that you and me can do as long as we can stop by Walmart first, right? You know, <laughs> this is something we are capable of. It's a miracle um, in that moment, not the amount that he feeds, but in the way that he feeds and in in the context of everything that's about to happen. So you go from he feeds the Jews to he feeds the Gentiles to he feeds his disciples who would then go and really impact the world. So we go from a, a thing of a lot of people feeding a smaller group, really impacting a smaller group to a smaller number of people impacting a little bit larger to a smaller group of people, even more. And now we get, to the road to Emmaus and he sets up shop and he takes the liberties of grabbing the bread at somebody else's house. Uh, you know, I'm a hungry fellow, but I don't normally uh, do such things. And, and, and he takes liberties to, to grab it, bless it and break it. And was curious about that in Jewish tradition, there, there's a word and I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it, but it's called uh, Burkett Hamazon. Um, there's certain words that I will pronounce and I realize, man, my country accent <laughs> is coming back really strong. Southern accent, Burkat Hamazon. Um, it's this Jewish uh, tradition. It's a prayer that's prayed after the meal. In, in Jewish culture, um, uh, as opposed to American culture, Jewish culture, prayers and the blessing uh, was always after everybody had eaten. We thank you for what we've just received. We thank mm -hmm. you for what you've provided. We want to honor you now. And there's this blessing that happens. And that's the, the name for it, Burkett Hamazon. And, uh, and, and that's how things rolled until Jesus shows up. And by contrast, by stark contrast, he never finishes the meal with it, but he always begins the meal with the blessing and then the breaking. And in my mind, the thing that probably stuck out to the people that were, were his followers but couldn't recognize him until that moment was, this is a stark contrast to how anybody does it other than Jesus. Yeah. You know, my Jesus, he doesn't do it after the meal. It's almost like he's saying, when we start the meal, we're praying first because when you hear my prayer, when you hear my blessing, things are just getting started, right? Yeah. And um, there's a beauty to that when he feeds the 5,000. Things are just getting going. This is a miracle. Things, we're just getting started. You haven't seen anything yet. And then again, and then again, and then again. Um, and I'm struck by, you know, it's one of those things, unless you study, you kind of miss some nuances in the Bible. And that was one that I missed for years. And then when I found it out, I thought, oh, my goodness, like, he's not only just changing the way a meal is eaten, he's changing the way that uh, we look at brokenness, Right. 
uh, because I, I have, I have the sincerely bad habit of thanking God um, for the healing after it happens or having all the pieces put back together after it happens. Yeah. And Jesus is now, uh, I bless. And then when there's brokenness, it's always something that I can do more from than something that's whole. And it doesn't, you know, and I, I want to say this and be clear, like it's not always that Jesus is the one that has broken whatever it is, our hearts or our lives, or, but it's always the case that anything submitted to him, he can do amazing things with. And um, but I was asking myself a lot of questions when I was studying this. And, and th these are a couple of the things that, that I realized. Um, if you need what you're feeding to satisfy your hunger, then your ministry is flawed. If, if I need what I'm doing in life, what I'm pouring into to be the thing that feeds me, then my ministry is flawed, whether it's to my family, to my wife, children, uh, church, whatever it would be, whatever area. If, if, if I need something reciprocal back from it to build me back up, if I need that 5,000 people, that thing to occur for me, ministry's flawed from the start, right? The second thing that, that, that's really um, been getting me is if my best only goes to those who love me, then I've blocked God from completely loving me. Yeah. Jesus at the table with his disciples, everybody gets fed, even Judas. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I'm not always really good at ministering to those well, to the people that um, I know don't like me. You know what I mean? It's like there's some people, uh, especially in the South, man, people are good at hiding it. You know, they'll really smile big uh, and then behind your back, it's a different story. Um, but there's been times where I knew that there were people that were not fond of me. And it's hard, it's kind of grit your teeth sort of moment. There's been moments either preaching where you're seeing somebody with a condemning look looking at you uh, and you're like, I'm going to look at other people because I want to focus on people that are receiving. Exactly. Um, and it happens in worship. It happens, you know, in, in, you know, there's just all these different areas you can see this happening. But what, what struck me is that if I'm only giving my best to those who love me, there's an area, what it's showing me is there's an area in my heart where I haven't let God love me back. Um, there's an area that I'm keeping back because if um, – if I'm only giving love to things worthy of being loved, then I don't know what the love of Jesus is, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an indicator for us. So, man, these are some things where I'm like, okay, I got to deal with that. Um, this is the next thing that I recognize. If your sacrifice decrease, decreases with what you believe to be less important, your values are skewed. Um, the sacrifice of Jesus increased, increased, increased as the numbers got less, less, and less but his impact was grander, grander, grander. Um, if my preparation and the way that I approach loving my kids is less than what I pour into uh, a 30-minute a sermon once a week as a pastor, man, there's a guy named Jerry Cook, and he said, if your ministry to your family has failed, your ministry has failed. Mm -hmm. um, and when I realize I cannot give my family leftovers, I cannot give my loved ones leftovers because, you know, sometimes we, we, we fall back on, I know they'll still love me even if I, you know, we tend to throw our junk, junk on those that we're closest to. Um, and um, I really have been dealing with, man, I, the things that I would say, this isn't as important of a moment. You know, sitting in a room with 12 people doesn't seem as important as sitting on a stage in front of 10 or 15,000. Yeah. Yet the sacrifice that he was making, that Jesus was making that moment was so much more significant. You know, by the time that he gets to the two on the road to Emmaus, he has sacrificed everything, and yet he's only having dinner with two. Um, less in the kingdom does not mean less, right? A lot of times less in the kingdom means so much more. Um, and you know, the final thing is this, is, as Jesus sacrificed increase, his numbers went down, but they really went up. Um, you know, by the end of it, when he's breaking the bread with the two followers, it's the representation of this is just the beginning. Eternity has just changed. 
you know, like history is forever, you know, at this moment, it's, it's all, it's all different. And when, when you think about that, man, like, it, it begins challenging me in my life to say, where am I broken that I've looked at as not good things and I don't want to think about, as opposed to, could I submit them to Jesus, let him bless the broken things, and then it do more. Also, and I think really what I want to talk about is, you know, I, I don't know if you've attached yourself to this, but man, I do struggle with two things. One, attaching what physically looks like more success to my value. Mm-hmm and really giving less than to things that don't seem as important. Absolutely. You know, and so uh, my wife called me up uh, several weeks ago. We had been painting and I had painted the um, bathroom and and our bathroom is like a floating cabinet, right? And so it doesn't go all the way to the floor. And uh, so I don't know how all that works, you know, engineering wise, but it just, it looks like it's floating and you have to literally get down on your hands and knees or lay on the floor to see the back wall. Cause you can't see it just walking in. And uh, I had painted everything <laughs> except under there. And my wife, uh, my wife walks in and Ashley goes, uh, well, did you get under the cabinet? I was like, no, I didn't get under the cabinet. Cause nobody who sees that. I mean, my kids when we're playing hide and seek, and uh, she goes, yeah, 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 I get that. She's like, you know, I suppose when Jesus says do everything as unto the Lord, he didn't mean painting below the cabinets. And I oh, okay. So. <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, but, man, I, I, if I'm honest, I have that struggle. So, I mean, I don't know. What do you think, Pam? Like, is, this, is this registering or? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting I have a story when I first got into medicine, I was uh, training as a CNA and I had a pretty awesome encounter with the Lord. Um, The CNA that was training me to make a long story short, she was very frustrated with the patient. Patient Mm. kept getting out of bed. Every time we'd try to move on to the next patient, she'd get up again and her bed alarm would go off and we'd have to go back. And this CNA was very outwardly expressing her frustration with this patient and the reality is, is she was detoxing uh, from meth. And so I walk into this room following the CNA, who's very clearly angry. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, this woman is a slave. Mm. And immediately, I just was overwhelmed with compassion for her. Like she may have made bad choices that put her in this position, but she's stuck now. She doesn't have a choice. And so that moment made Every situation that I walk into with a patient, like it's like the Holy Spirit is in the background and those corners that I want to cut as a human because I want to hurry or because I'm getting behind or I want to be more efficient. There's always that voice like this patient deserves 100% of what you have to give Mm -hmm. time. You know, I'll redeem your time, but don't cut corners. You know, how would you want this to go if it was your family member sitting here, if it was you? And so... I just am grateful for that because it started very early, you know, in my time in medicine. And so I can do that. I have, you know, just, there's always that little voice in the back of my mind, but I, I hear what you're saying because there are moments that I'm tempted uh, to hurry or to skip something. And I hear that voice like, stop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All of your attention right now. Yeah. And uh, the more, the more, cluttered my life gets or busy it gets the 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 more i have to fight to mm-hmm. not just cut the corner yeah. that, that nobody else will see that i have to fight to paint under the cabinets mm-hmm. um it was funny because like a few weeks after that you know uh, we were painting the kitchen and uh and I, I i moved the whole refrigerator to paint behind the refrigerator and and even it, whoever had done it before me hadn't done that. And so I felt really good. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's a victory. <laughs> it's true. You it's know, true. But, but it was a place where I'm like, no, I want to, I want to do this right. I want to, I want to honor this right, you know? Um, and so, you know, I, I think when our identity is getting so attached to, um, we, we give more, when it's more seen, Mm -hmm. it's just not the heart of Jesus. Right. And, um, and uh, my daughter the other day, 
um, we were getting ready to leave to go visit family. And we said, hey, can you watch a bear? Was, you know, baby boy, right? And he's crawling and he's getting everywhere. I said, hey, can you just watch bear for a few minutes and entertain him while we get this done? And I hear, uh, I hear Ella say uh, to her mom, I'm, I'm downstairs, and I hear her say to her mom, you're welcome for me watching Bear. And she was trying, I guess, to express, like, I'm doing it. I'm doing, you know, what you asked. But I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, like, that's like you're saying you're welcome for me breathing. This is something we do. We're family. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was like, that's not, you know, you don't need to say you're welcome for me doing this. I'm like, no, we're family. This is how... We roll, but sometimes I think we want accolades, or at least I do, for things that just should be. Yep. Um, and it should be a part of, uh, of what we do. But, man, you just the, – the, the heart and the lifestyle of Jesus is as he went lower, the impact was broader. And, um, and there's just something there that, that I really – you know, I connect with when, you know, and more and more lately when David says, you know, you remember the story of King David and he wants to make a sacrifice and the place where he's at, the guy that has the materials to make the sacrifice says, well, I'll just give it to you. And David's like, no, I don't want to give the Lord something that I'll, that costs me nothing. Yeah. And um, I feel like there's some people who are going to watch this and they're in a season of sacrifice and it's costing you more than what you thought. I don't know if it's if it's fighting through, fight, battling for your marriage, or, or 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 being relentless and praying for a kid, believing that God's going to change the course and direction of your son or daughter's life, or or or, or what it might be. But you feel like the sacrifice is costing you more um, than what you could imagine. But I just want you to know, man, the greater the sacrifice, even if you think it's a smaller impact, man, the greater the sacrifice, God honors that. He is so faithful. He's a, he is a rewarding God. You look uh, in Hebrews 11, he's just such a rewarding God. And, um, you know, the, the kind of faith that I've realized here lately, my, my, um, my mentor tells me this all the time. He said, the kind of faith that, that God loves is, is the faith that trusts him without being able to know the outcome, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I'm like, man, that's true because um, that's, that is when it's faith, right? You know, if you know what's going to happen next, I mean, there's no faith involved. Right. But uh, I look at this and I'm like, man, I just, I really want to, Jesus in my life, I, I, I want to make sure that um, when it's down to just two, you know, I take the opportunity to, to, to love well. When it's down to just two, uh, the sacrifices are worth it because really it's so much broader than that, you know? Um, but yeah, yeah. Anything stern on your heart just to share tonight? That you just anything that you feel like somebody might be watching and there's just an encouragement that needs to come? Mm. As I put you crazy on the spot. <laughs> well, you know what you said about um how it's worth the sacrifice. Um, I have seen time and time again where I'll be in a, a situation where there's pushback, 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 and I step back from it. For, you know, it's kind of like I find myself getting wrapped up in it, and I find myself kind of being swept away by the current, and my heart and mind being in a place that I'm not necessarily okay with. You know, you don't feel good when you're not responding appropriately, and um when I change my perspective, when I take a step back from the situation and say, okay, you know, I, the, the instinctive thing to do is to lash out or, um, you know, I want to react instead of respond and then just let God speak to me on how to respond. The moment I change how I'm handling something, it's instant. It's instant results. Um, I had a situation at work recently where there was just a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback and I was given into it and, you know, getting frustrated. And, uh, one night I was just totally at my wits end with it. And God said, just be kind, hmm. go, you know, I know you don't have time to add more to your pile of things to do right this moment, but do it anyway. Hmm. You know, take a few extra minutes, maybe find a way to be more diligent and, you know, make the time, it'll be worth it. And it totally was this person's attitude completely changed. And, you know, it's just been great. And I also got to be, you know, a witness to the people that I'm working around and trying to lead and lead well, 
that if we just can take an extra measure of kindness to give to somebody, it's that, you know, you take the hatchet out of their hand. Yeah. It's how it's described to me. It's like, you know, they're coming at you and they just want to fight. And as soon as you respond in kindness or love, they're kind of taken back. Like, well, why are you being nice to me? Mm-hmm. And then they're like, oh, I can't really be mean to you because you're not being mean to me. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, the fuel is just gone. So I would encourage, you know, maybe someone's uh, in a situation like that where there's fuel. Yeah. And as soon as you can change your perspective and come in an opposite spirit yeah. and ask God how he would have you handle something. And, you know, maybe it is making a sacrifice for me. It was a sacrifice of time. It's tasks that I don't have really time for, but they need to be done. And yeah. we all kind of have to take on more. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and ultimately not letting somebody else control you, you know, yeah. Like, man, absolutely so many people walk through the day controlled by other people uh and you know, it's, it just doesn't have to roll that way mm-hmm. uh you know i remember hearing somebody say man the greatest message i'll ever preach is one that doesn't have words you know it's just gosh turning around and doing the hard thing like that uh amen man well that was probably for me <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much for tonight, man. What an honor to, to get to have this time with you. So cool. Uh, I'd love to just take a moment to, to just pray over everybody that's going to be watching this. And just, um, we want to encourage you if you're watching tonight, man, take opportunity. And we say it every week, but if there's prayer requests or something, go to the prayer wall, uh, the Warriors wall, and put it on there. There's, uh, I, we get emails all the time about cool things that are happening or prayer requests. And so it's really an honor, but do that step out. It's not, don't wait and say, I'll get to it tomorrow. But if there's something that's on your mind, get there and do that. Uh, but there's so many resources, not only provided through this ministry, but uh, plenty around it. And, and be proactive uh, in your walk with God and your, in your journey forward. Amen. Cool. Mm-hmm. Let me just pray. And uh, Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for the sacrifice that, that you made for us because you were so in love with us that you so wanted eternity with us, Jesus, that you died, um, that you that you stole the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and, and, and you have the victory. And so, God, I thank you that uh, this week you would overwhelm the things that are overwhelming us. God, I thank you that you would um, just be the glory and the lifter of our heads. And Father, I thank you, God, right now that for those watching, I pray over them that your face shine upon them, that you bless them and they're coming and they're going and they're lying down, they're rising up. Uh, And Lord, I thank you that you just give us the mind of Christ and wisdom of God as we move forward through this week. And Lord, I thank you, God, that we would be people that would be responders to your word, that we would be um, crazy faithful even in the things that seem small but we most likely carry the largest impact. We thank you, God, that we would be responders and be obedient to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Pam, thanks so much. Have a great night. Thank you, you too. Yeah, I sure will. And thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us through this. And uh, it's been good. It's been good. I look forward to doing it again sometime soon, okay? All right, man. God bless you guys. Bye-bye. Bye.